Salman Rushdie works within nether regions, and I mean this in a lot of different respects, but we have in Rushdie a remarkable figure, a quite entertaining gentleman, as, as a matter of fact. Uh, biographically, born in India to, uh, to a family that was, uh, that was largely Muslim. Uh, he was born within a few months of the partition of India and Pakistan, uh, where India became largely Hindu, Pakistan became primarily Muslim, and all of this is as a result of the British Empire pulling out. So there are a couple of different divisions going on there. He was educated largely in England, Cambridge, and became very much a product of uh, a certain generation of British uh, uh, satirical postmodern uh, authors. He splits his time these days between, uh, between England and the United States. He is a figure of uh, high literary culture and pop culture. He, he pops up on chat shows on TV constantly. Uh, he is a cross-cultural guy in many, many respects. And that's part of the fun of reading him because he's just hopping all over the place. He does not seem bound particularly by any limitations to, okay, now I have to write this way. And so his work can be remarkably florid in its, um, in its profusion. And that's a lot of fun to read. He, uh, he's, uh, he, he struck it big uh, around really with his second novel in like 1980 I believe it came out called Midnight's Children a remarkable epic of uh, uh, a multi-generational family uh, and on which you can read the uh, the, the history of uh, uh, of India as a nation and a culture um, but he took, uh, uh, he took part of it. He took the bulk of the first chapter of that and, and bits from the second chapter as well, melded them together, fused them a little bit with a little connecting uh, tissue, and produced uh, uh, what he released as a short story called The Perforated Sheet. And it is a remarkable and highly entertaining portrait of uh, uh, of a character uh, and really of a family as it's uh, as it is laying itself out uh, and it is a uh, it is clearly meant to be read on multiple levels you can read it literally and individually as the story of this family or you could read it allegorically as the story of India is uh, writ large, where the characters themselves become uh, very much wink wink uh, representations of the uh, of the the Indian subcontinent in, in all of its manifestations. And some writers who are perhaps more conservative would perhaps try and make this a little bit more obscure. So it would be a uh, it, it would be more of a puzzle, would be more realistic on uh, on multiple levels, so that you really have to dig down to find the uh, the symbolic value of these individuals to broaden it out to the geopolitical. Uh, he doesn't do that. He is perfectly happy uh, making it at times uh, laughably. Um, laughably uh, clunky <laughs> in its symbolism, as you would read, honestly, in uh, medieval allegories, where they, where it doesn't always function so smoothly as a literal tale, and the only way to really get a hold of it is to engage on the allegorical level. He's fine with doing that at different points. He doesn't mind mixing genres, even genres seemingly separated by centuries and millennia of time. He is very much a, uh, a practicer of magic realism, 
which is just an, uh, in his iteration of, of the tradition, uh, brings about a, a certain whimsical quality, whereas the, uh, in, in the core tradition of magical realism with uh, Garcia uh, Marquez, you get um, uh, the magic is somehow uh, more enveloping of the realism. It is a little bit more prominent. The, uh, the quirks that come out in uh, the magical aspects that come out in Rushdie tend to be more idiosyncratic and just momentary, little flourishes that don't necessarily uh, offer up meaning as well uh, or as uh, lushly uh, as, as the, uh, the Latin American tradition, but that cast one more element of peculiarity and whimsy into the situation so that you're constantly as a reader being you know sort of like pushed back just a little to say you know what is going on here there's so much happening how do you make sense of it well that is the postmodern condition that is the condition of life in the late 20th and early 21st century when we are all bombarded by a culture that is frankly everywhere and so, so overwhelming that we have trouble keeping up. And Rushdie is, uh, Rushdie is aware of that and he's sort of commenting on it a little bit. He uses the start of this story, uh, The Perforated Sheet and Midnight's Children, as, uh, as, as a kind of uh, autobiography in a sense where he characterizes uh, the, the birth of the protagonist in a first person setting uh, here. Uh, I was born in the city of Bombay, dot, 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 once upon a time. And mm, 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 once upon a time, what does that say? Well, that sounds like, uh, of course, a fairy tale, uh, a naturally artificial um, uh, literary reference. Um, well, artificial is a big word but it is self-conscious. It is as if this person were sitting down to write uh, and say, well, okay, how do I go about writing? And that question of the textuality of it, the question of the falsity of the text, the question of the instability and unreliability of the narrator, uh, these are all being folded in just in that first sentence. I was born in the city of Bombay which as a phrase can be transposed onto the beginnings of how many novels in the novelistic tradition. The novel as it began uh, was largely the story of a single life which begins at birth and ends at death. And so that sense of being born is the proper time to begin a novel. The traditional, conventional way to begin a novel is established right there. And then you see that very cheeky dot 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 ellipsis suggesting that the author, the writer, the narrator, is thinking right there and trying to come up with something and then just throws up his hand and say, yeah, once upon a time. Um, but then he comes back and he doubts himself. No, that won't do. There's no getting around from the date. That won't do. Very British um, uh, locution there. A little, uh, that sounds like something a proper Brit would say. No, nope, that won't do. It's very, uh, it's very English. English, just one brief clause away from the name drop of Bombay. Mumbai in today's uh, vernacular. Uh, that is automatically, okay, that's setting up a couple of different things there, the British and the Indian. Ooh, there, there's, some, there's something going on there, something's happening. Um, that won't do. There's no way getting around the date. And so referencing back to the first sentence. So automatically you are referencing the, uh, it is a remarkably self-referential text just in these first couple of words here. Um, self-reference, self-consciousness, uh, doubt, misdirection, uh, redirection, all of these things going on that the reader is trying to figure out how to position the text in terms of its 
authority, in terms of its perspective, and uh, in terms of its reliability. Um, no getting around the date. I was born in Dr. Narlikar's nursing home, a uh, little foreign sounding, non-English, let's say, on August 15th, 1947. So very specific. And so we go from once upon a time, which now suddenly sounds a little more defensive, like, you know, you don't really want to admit it, you don't want to talk about it for whatever reason, you don't want to go there, but then suddenly you're getting very specific. So there's a contradiction right in that. And then, of course, we learn that you read the, uh, the footnotes, and anybody who knows their history would know that this is the date on which Britain separated from India. And you get, as a result, the split from, uh, of Pakistan off uh, as a majority Muslim uh, independent nation, and the whole world order as the Indian subcontinent knew it uh, at that point, the whole world order is shifted. And so this character is a creation of that instant, just like the character of India, the character of Pakistan as nations, um, and is, uh, he is born, uh, this character is born of a kind of instability and liminality is the term, the nether regions. And so it, it's automatically, there's so much going on here in terms of uh, the colonial aspect, the post-colonial aspect, the, uh, the post-modernism of self-reflexivity and uh, self-consciousness of the narrator, the instability, the unreliable narrator. Oh, there's so much going on here that you just have to let it go and ride with it. This is what Rushdie is doing. Rushdie is bringing up all of this stuff in a profusion of chaos, but it's really very charming in the way he goes about it. Especially, you know, again that little uh, that little phrase that won't do. Where just in a little bit he seeps out just a little character, just a little personality, just a little. Oh no 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 no! Uh, it's funny because. In a world of chaos, sometimes those little quirks of your identity, as convoluted they are, um, as contradictory as they are, that's all you can cling to. Um, he tells the story of uh, Well, of himself. Now, he himself, Rushdie, was born a couple of months after the particular date. We learned that he was born right at the stroke of midnight. So, of course, it's got symbolism screaming all over it, very deliberately and cheekily so. Um, but it is a... Uh, uh, it, he is clearly appropriating or expropriating uh, a certain cultural significance in that date. So automatically you see this character as uh, a symbol. It's more than just an individual, it is a symbol. Um, and, or an allegory, if you will. But you can read it on that level, but it's kind of limiting and he will refuse to uh, uh, let you rest comfortably in that reading because he does bring out little quirks of personality throughout. Um, he talks about how uh, um, little moments of uh, magical realism creep in. Uh, he talks about the um, uh, When leaning down to pray, the character who uh, who who is having um, a crisis uh, or uh, a, con a crisis of faith, let's say, uh, in his Muslim faith, leans down on his prayer rug, bumps his head, and uh, rubies fall out of his nose uh, instead of blood, 
and uh, and this is just sort of you know tossed in there and it's very disturbing and very odd all these little moments uh like that um and there are much more in the in the novel that proceeds from this um are whimsical in their nature. They're just sort of tossed in and you can sit there and break apart the symbolism of the rubies and the blood and all of this stuff. And he, Rushdie is inviting you to do that, I would say, but he is at the same time not at all concerned that you uh, that you be able to do this. He's happy to just keep writing and tossing new stuff out there. And every time you think, okay, this is important, I have to, stop what I'm reading and dig in and I can't go any further until I understand what's with the rubies. He is blithely indifferent to your plight. He's just going to keep going and you can catch up with him whenever you want. But until that point, eh, the river's going to keep flowing. The bulk of the story um, turns to the uh, the character of um, uh, uh, of the protagonist's grandfather, um, this this character who uh, who was born at the stroke of midnight in August twenty seventh or whatever, uh, his grandfather's story gets told, and his name is Adam. Adam, <laughs> again. Uh, spelt in the Muslim way, A-A-D-A-M, let's say. Uh, but uh, again, just putting in another wrinkle, another like, is he seriously going with that kind of symbolism? Is he seriously going to be that heavy handed? Nothing about this feels heavy handed, but every now and then it's like, oh, come on, you're not going to do that. But he does, and you got to go with it. The character of the grandfather is um, uh, he, he go he is brought up in India uh, when it is still fully whole with the Muslim half or the, the the Muslim soon to be Pakistan folded into the national identity and he is a um, he has been to Europe to study. He is a former, uh, uh, he grew up in a fairly poor area and he makes uh, a friend in this uh, local ferryman, a guy who uh, just takes people up and down river and across river and all, all this stuff. Uh, but he's this local colorful guy who dispenses all sorts of wisdom, teases the young smart kid and, uh, and at a certain point he goes off the grandfather, the kid, goes off to school in Europe and he comes back as a doctor. And well, this is uh, this is awkward. And I think in, in, in a very recognizable way. And here we get a little bit of, I would say, realism brought in because suddenly the class differences uh, between these two characters are brought into relief when he comes down and he takes a ride on his f old friend's boat and his old friend starts to tease him a little bit. And the old friend takes particular, uh, who is used to spouting off um, all sorts of folk uh, sayings and folk um, uh, parables and uh, all of these little uh, ordinary human um, blather, often quite ridiculous. When confronted with this newly Europeanized, enlightened, westernized Indian boy, and he takes it as a bit of an affront and he dwells on it and he becomes quite hostile. Um, Adam is taking a, or Dr. Aziz, we will call him at this point, Dr. Aziz, uh, is taking this little ride and he has with him his little medical bag. And the medical bag is more than just a bag. 
uh, objects tend to in uh, in Rushdie take on great symbolic weight, and uh, he he likes to take the most trivial and ordinary uh, objects and just sort of fixate on them, almost in a um, uh, almost in a fetishistic way, in the way he just sort of alienates it and probes all of the. Uh, multiple meanings within it of the most ordinary objects and for a doctor an ordinary object would be his medical bag he returns with this um, little leather bag that doctors well doctors used to carry when they would make house calls and stuff it's not so much a thing these days but it is a uh, it is very much a sign of his profession Dr. Aziz's, and it's a sign of his education. It has a, a it has a stamp on it, I believe, or a, or a label that lists uh, where he came from, where he got it, and it's Heidelberg in Germany. Um, it, it is a talis, talisman of uh, of European education, of enlightenment, of all of these westernizing influences that this young man has returned with and uh and and uh and the old boatman takes great offense to this and starts digging into it and um becoming quite ho quite hostile uh his name is ty ty is uh ty you get the sense is an old person but uh nobody knows how old and Aziz, Dr. Aziz, has the temerity to ask him on, on this return trip of his, you know, hey, how old are you? And Ty just resists the question. He won't even answer. And in that, that simple question, how old are you? You can see a clash because Dr. Aziz wants to quantify this man's age, wants to get to the bottom of his uh, identi identity in a mathematically precise manner. Ty is at once, uh, you get the sense, very old, but also timeless. He is the voice of uh, the common uh, the common poor in India and so he has been there forever and here is this Western person coming in suddenly and saying well no let's let's get to the bottom how old are you let's try and take you and your uh, non quantifiable don't work by the clock um, you know resistant independent uh, free -form, free form culture and squeeze it into a regularized template that the enlightened world uh, will understand. Ty resists. He won't do it. But he lashes out all the more and he starts attacking, focusing on the bag, repeatedly referencing that it is a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's made out of a pig. It is pigskin. It's leather. It's a leather bag, and he keeps drilling down that you know it's it's not it's not just leather. It's pigskin, and Ty is uh, leaning on the uh, the opposition to um, uh, well the uh, the reject the dietary restrictions of the Muslim faith that ha that uh, basically bans pork products, and so. Pigskin is particularly offensive, um, and yet here is the young doctor as he's returning with this, and he just dwells on it. And you can tell it's uh, going from somebody uh, who Ty had been sort of a mentor to this boy. You get the sense, almost a Falstaff figure uh, for this young man as he grew up. And the young man seems to genuinely like him, but uh, and and be amused by him and all of that stuff. But now he's getting this cold shoulder. So think in terms of you know the the power structure here. Uh, here is the young man coming back in a fully colonized India, and 
he is coming back from Europe as a representative of that Western European uh, uh, autonomy and hegemony. It's a role reversal. You have this very old man who is used to being just sort of, you know, he, not necessarily an authority figure, but certainly a parental figure, and someone who has tried to teach the young man throughout his life, teach him a lot of uh, folk ways and superstitions and just entertain him perhaps, but certainly to imbue the young man with a certain, uh, with a certain folk wisdom. And now, this young man has come back and he is suddenly like, you know, superior in authority to Todd. It's, it's an edible struggle right there. So again, we're getting all of these different contexts in there. We're getting edibilism, we're getting the post-colonial, the colonial, the, uh, the class clashes of the, uh, the rising middle class versus the, uh, the permanent underclass, if you will. Uh, you're getting all of this wrapped up in this little nugget and they're just going for a boat ride for God's sakes. The, uh, the story gets particularly amusing when the boat ride ends at the patient's house where the young doctor has been summoned and he has been, uh, he has been called in to consult on uh, uh, the, uh, a, a complaint from the daughter of a, uh, a, a local dignitary, if you will, a local gentry. And he gets ushered in, and it's, it's all rather mysterious. This big house uh, that is very dusty and a little bit worn, and uh, he meets, the, uh, he, he meets the, uh, the father, the patriarch of the house, who is blind, but he has a great uh, he, he's a great interest in art, so you have this blind aficionado of the arts, which is a little bit contradicted and convoluted, and you can, you know, again, have at it, go crazy, chase that rabbit hole down wherever. Rusty will be, you know, just sort of going on about his business, and you can catch up to him at your leisure. But the doctor, <laughs> the doctor needs to uh, examine the patient. She has, a, uh, she has a complaint about one thing or the other, and he needs to examine her. But he goes into this room where she supposedly is, and he finds these uh, two women who are quite muscular, apparently, and imposing, uh, standing about five or six feet apart, holding opposite ends of a large sheet. Uh, and in the middle of that sheet, there is a small hole. I think it's around seven inches in diameter, they say. This is the eponymous perforated sheet of the title. Um, and he has to uh, examine the patient, as the father explains. He has to examine the patient through this sheet because propriety insists that the young lady, who is the patient, uh, have her dignity respected and of course modesty is a very big thing in the uh, uh, in, in most religious communities and sexuality is generally poo-pooed upon so they uh, they have to go through this facade of a uh, of an examination and it's all really very funny because she's just like sticking little parts of her body through this tiny little hole uh, and he never gets to see her but over time uh, you know he'll go and he'll he'll give a uh, thing it's like all right well that looks like this you know, okay your your stomach is having a problem you know can can I see uh, could I possibly see her belly uh, I, I think that's where the uh, that's where the the first chapter breaks off in midnight's children uh, which is just ludicrous. The doctor, you know, I, I'm being asked to treat this woman for abdominal distress, but, you know, 
can I possibly see just a section of the belly? <laughs> uh, the clash of Western medicine and, uh, and indigenous primitivist, if, if you will, um, uh, religious and cultural traditions. But over time, he does manage to alleviate some of her uh, some of her problems, and new ones tend to crop up. And each time he goes back and sees a different little chunk of the body sticking out of that little hole. Um, and so, over the course of months, and it turns out really even years, uh, of repeated visits. He is uh, getting a look at this young lady, never in her entirety, never seen her face. Uh, he starts to wish that he could. Um, at one point it says, so gradually Dr. Aziz came to have a picture of Nassim in his mind, a badly fitting collage of her severally inspected parts. This phantasm of a partitioned woman began to haunt him, and not only in his dreams. Glued together by his imagination, she accompanied him on all his rounds. She moved into the front room of his mind, so that waking and sleeping he could feel his fingertips feel in his fingertips the softness of her ticklish skin and the perfect tiny wrists or the beauty of the ankles. He could smell her lavender and, and shambelli. He could hear her voice and her helpless laughter of a little girl, but she was heedless because he had never seen her face. He's falling in love, uh, bit by bit. He's seeing little snippets of her. Never the entire thing. Little segmented, separated parts uh, that never really cohere, that never really come together for him. But he falls in love little bits, bit by bit. And in the end, over time again, he is, uh, the restrictions slowly get loosened because over time he starts to establish trust with the father who who will eventually say, well, yeah, sure, you know, this is my daughter and, you know, yes, you can examine her, you are the good doctor and whatever. And so the, the restrictions start to come down at the, uh, at the allowance of the father figure. Um, and over time, uh, these two will both fall in love. And the girl, you get the sense, is in fact inviting, uh, inviting the doctor back by coming up with a lot of symptoms or a lot of uh, ailments that are perhaps not entirely sincere. Uh, she has a lot of problems that the doctor just has to keep coming back for. And they're all a little bit uh, odd. Um, so you get the sense that she's sort of drawing him along, and it's this weird seduction. There is this great dynamic between the two, and it is so, it's spoken of so seductively on, uh, on, a, on a sexuality level, but also emotional, because he is starting to think about her, and he, uh, you know, she is infecting his mind, and they've had very little contact, but he's filling in the blanks, he's putting together the pieces, and thus starting to really bond with her on a uh, emotional, spiritual, romantic level, however you want to uh, take that. Fold in the religious context of this, how you know, the restrictions are making it so difficult for them to see one another, and yet at the same time, they are making it uh, almost inevitable that curiosity will seep in and cause them to fall in love. The religion is, called, uh, is separating them, as the sheep does, but the religion is also drawing them together, as the whole allows. On top of all of this, it is not hard to bring in the allegory, because, well, first of all, one of the details about the uh, uh, one of the details about the grandfather that we are given early on is that he has quite a remarkable nose, and they describe it, uh, or Rushdie describes it in terms of a very wide bridge that kind of crookedly tapers down, and maybe even has a little 
uh, twist at the bottom, uh, which, which becomes very pointy. Uh, and this is almost a, uh, an exact description of the shape of India. Look at an India, look at India on a map or a globe, and you will see a very broad northern hemisphere, and then as it goes further south, it twists itself into a little point, and that is India. And he wears, this grandfather wears the map of India on his face essentially. So, the symbolism is not hard to see. Add to that then, this girl who turns out to be, remember, this is the grandfather, this girl turns out to be the grandmother of the man we started with, who was born at the stroke of, uh, stroke of midnight on the, the separation of Pakistan and, uh, and India and the pulling back of London, of, of, of England, Britain. She is seen in segmented parts. They never really come together for him in this story. He's just seeing all of these independent little chunks that never really fit together, except in his own mind. That's also India. India, which is a vast, vast land with many different cultures, many different languages, the partitioning of Pakistan from India proper is itself just a, uh, you know, just the most superficial split that you can find. There are many other little sects and, uh, and, and opposite, opposing cultures within the broader Indian identity. Most of this is happening in the area called Kashmir in the north, which is just on the other side of Pakistan, left in India. And that has been a war zone, essentially, uh, from that night in 47, where uh, it is a majority Muslim population in this district that is uh, being kept from, let's say, Pakistan and kept within India. And it is a, uh, a, a point of great geopolitical contention today. Those inherent contradictions, those inherent conflicts of many different parts never quite coalescing into a whole, that has, uh, that has great meaning, that has great significance. And Rushdie is pointing that out in a very cheeky and playful way, you know, oh, I'm going to show you my elbow through this sheet. Uh, but you can read it on this way. And it fits because India is at once all one identity, you could say, while at the same time being a multitude of identities within that in conflict with one another. And how do you read that? How do you understand that? Can it be both at the same time? Does it have to be both at the same time? Will one ever supersede the other? Will India fragment into all of its disparate parts, or will it ever learn to coalesce into a single identity composed of those parts? He's not writing a, uh, he, he's not writing a book of uh, political essays here. He's not dealing with this in any, you know, uh, straight-laced academic, uh, intellectualized world politics kind of way. He's having fun with it. It's very serious, and he's not necessarily dismissing that seriousness of it, but he's weaving it into a much broader portrait of world culture that is naturally pluralistic and disparate. And sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it's very funny, sometimes it's very sad, sometimes it's tragic. But understanding how all of that weaves together is crucial. 
and you can take issue with his positioning of himself in many ways, Rushdie's positioning of himself as sort of the, the maestro conducting all of this grand symphony of, uh, uh, of disparate voices um, and blithely sort of ignoring certain, uh, certain realities. Um, but he's still giving these voices some airtime. And it is wonderfully charming. He is writing as a proper British citizen. I, I believe he, uh, I, I, like 20 years ago or 15 years ago, I think he was knighted by the Queen. Uh, he is very much a, an exemplar of the good Cambridge Don. Um, but he is also writing within this tradition of his homeland. That is not always complimentary, not always uh, um, he's not out to make the case for anyone. He is out, I would say, just me, I would say he is out to try and point out the richness and the contradictions, the tragedy and the absurdity that all weave together in his own little uh, postmodern, postcolonial, magic, magical realism uh, soup of the uniquely complicated world that has evolved as the empire, various empires, British Empire. And more recently, let's say uh, the Cold, War, the end of the Cold War, and even the pulling back of the American uh, author authorial structure over world government. Uh, he is he is offering a portrait of what that looks like, what the risks are, and trying to position us all in a perspective that can make it survivable.